BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 104, Obamacare, Part 2. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging, covering treatment and solutions that include bioidentical hormone pellet therapy, safe and affordable skin rejuvenation, and spa quality botanical skincare. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. So we're continuing a conversation that we started in a previous podcast about trying to understand the medical system uh, for the consumer, for the person who is ill or has family members that are ill, uh, and for the provider, for the physician or mental health professional or whomever it may be that interacts with the system in their efforts to provide care for the patient. So you were telling me that as a physician, when you went to medical school, <laughs> the training and focus and messaging to you primarily was on looking at the patient that's in front mm -hmm. of you, trying to figure out what's wrong, where do they hurt, how's the system of their body in distress, mm -hmm. and what interventions can I do to help them feel better. Using And your mind, your brain is the computer in it. Yes. And it, so, so it's the art and science. It's of the medicine art and of science of medicine. So you're observing, you're thinking, you're talking, you're taking all this in, and then you're thinking through a problem list of mm -hmm. what are the problems, what are the things I can do to fix this. You know, it's kind of like we had soap notes. So you can think yeah. of this when you go to we your, did in my you, practice as well. When you go to a doctor, you can yeah. think soap is as is subjective. Mm -hmm. And then, and, and that's kind of what the patient tells you was is wrong, and what mm -hmm. you see. And then the objective is your physical exam, and what and what you're looking at. Auto mechanics use those too. When you take it to the auto mechanic, and he says it's making a funny noise. He says, "What kind of noise is it making?" Yeah. Well, it's going vroom, vroom, vroom. <laughs> okay, that's a yeah. soap. No, vroom, that's vroom, the vroom. subjective yeah. part. That's right. That's oh, that a good sounds like the kumquat is broken in your yeah. car. <laughs> <laughs> little lady you know yeah you know it could be easier yeah. we could do medical care like <laughs> fixing our car but then that wouldn't work either so um right. that doesn't work that smoothly anyway uh, but the a is of the soap is the assessment like how do i put all this together mm -hmm. what is the problem in my view today in association with other problems and usually we only have room for three or four problems at a time in our minds and then we put a plan down p is plan so that's how your doctor's thinking while you're talking. Mm -hmm. They're so doing a mental checklist. So it's probably best to get the most amount of care out of your time is to think about it ahead of time. Figure out what you want to say in that first little what's wrong So when part. you go to the doctor, the interactive responsible part for you is you think about it before you get to the doctor's office. What do I want to discuss with the doctor? What's my symptomology? How do I explain it? What points do I need covered? What do I need to know when I leave? You know, specifically, questions. And if you're prepared and limited, you don't go in with 37 questions it's, about your grandmother's sacroiliac. And you yeah, don't talk, and talk about, about your family, talk about you yourself. You go in and talk about you. So that you save time. If you just go there as an empty canvas and look at the doctor starry-eyed and say, fix me. You're not going to get what you <laughs> really came there for because everyone in their mind has an idea, an expectation mm -hmm. of what they want to have fixed. Yeah. So you need to understand what your expectation is. And at the end of the visit, if your doctor didn't, sometimes we don't get it right. You need to say now, not at the very end where they're walking out, but before that, you need to say, I came in with this problem and I really need a solution for yeah. it. Yeah, I you go know, to the doctor, I'm anxious. I'm either afraid or curious. You know, is something wrong, is something broken, is it significant or is it minuscule? Right. And is mm -hmm. there something that I can do or need to do mm -hmm. that'll make me better? Or you know, do I need to go home and write my will? Uh, right, and and you want to know what the expectation of the doctor is from his her, or her treatment. So yes, so that is so. Not only do you need to write and think about your problem, and writing it down helps, but then you need to think about you need to also think about what you expected out of that visit. Mm -hmm. And so, if you expected to be fixed right away, then you tell the doctor, "Well, I thought this was going to be like a one visit deal, and yeah. I was going to get." And then the doctor has time to then justify why he or she is. Well, we need some tests first, then I can do it. We're going to have you come back once. Well, how many visits is it going to be? Well, maybe two or three. Mm -hmm. So at least you have your expectations. You have to ask the right questions. So those are things that you can use when you're seeing your doctor that I think will help 
go efficiently, so, not waste your time or his or her time, and then and get what you want. Right. But we're still talking about the ideal, which you discussed in medical school, mm -hmm. which is the interaction <laughs> between the physician and the patient. Which is so, so you follow the that core to of health care. Logical conclusion. And I come to you as a physician, mm -hmm. I discuss my little concerns, and at the end of the day you say, you know what, you need a prescription of this. If you take this once a day for X days, you'll be better. So you hand me the prescription. And on the form it says doctor, federal ID number, prescribed substances number, mm -hmm. all that stuff, and then generic, non-generic. And you write down the drug you want me to take mm -hmm. and the rules for mm -hmm. taking it. So I take that to my pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And the pharmacy says, well, let's see your insurance card. Mm -hmm. They don't say, let's see your prescription. They say, look at my insurance card. They put that data in. Mm -hmm. Then they look at the prescription, and they come back and say, can't give you that. The doctor didn't mark generic, and that particular drug is not in our Fred's formulary. Fred's having a lot of trouble with pharmacies. So well, but no, but no, no, conceptually, <laughs> I know. Th this happens to a lot of people. I know it does. So we get the what's phone a formulary? You know, it's not in our formulary. Oh, is that the cabinet on the left, or is that the cabinet on the right? It means what your insurance plan will pay for. And in terms and doctors of can't drugs keep track, or medicines. Yeah, medicines. Doctors don't know that Blue Cross pays for this, but but United Healthcare pays for this. Mm -hmm. They're writing the the drug they think you need. Well, it's hard enough for me to figure out what the, what the <laughs> prescription means. How do you keep track of that? You know, uh, ibuprofen know. versus uh, antihistamine versus uh, whatever. <laughs> That's what you study, and that's yes. what you know, and yeah. I don't know that. But they, it may have four different brand names in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So you write it for the brand name that you are familiar with or like best for reasons. You know, like an antidepressant. How do you decide which one to give me? Well, in general, we, that's, we take pharmacy. Yes. And so we learn what, what one antidepressant does that the other doesn't. Then we mm -hmm. also read about it because they're all a little different, and then we use it, that's called the practice of medicine, and we see what it really does. Yeah, like Wellbutrin, if I'm taking an antidepressant, that's the one I want, because it doesn't inhibit my sex life. Uh, and <laughs> but it does in some people, so, so you okay. know, it's not everybody. <laughs> yeah. And in women, I think it inhibits sex life more than it does in men, but you know, and th that's practice. That's not written anywhere, that's just because yes. I have people come back and say, hey, I took Wellbutrin, and I take care of more women than men, and, and my sex life just tanked, and so, that's how I, I kind of learn yeah. about that because we talk about sex lives a lot in my office. Yeah. So, so, so we're, we're back to the doctor-patient relationship mm -hmm. and the understanding and knowledge and art of medicine is now starting to get infected by systemic issues, mm -hmm. one of which is the insurance company, one of which is the pharmacy. For instance, if I don't have insurance, and you write mm -hmm. me the same prescription. Mm -hmm. And I go to the pharmacy and say, here's the prescription. And they say, let me see your insurance card. I said, I don't have insurance. And they say, okay, that costs this amount mm -hmm. for so many pills. Mm -hmm. the, the, I can buy as many as you've written at one mm -hmm. setting if I want to mm -hmm. pay for it. Right. But if I'm using my insurance, the insurance company will only let them give me so many in a, in a window of 30 days. Mm -hmm. So the pharmacy gets a uh, stocking fee every yes. time it fills the right. prescription. So they're okay with that because that means I got to come back every month and mm -hmm. get it, but and they get a fee every month. And it's not productive in your life to do that. And I can't get three, four, or five months worth mm -hmm. of this medicine. Why I don't? Even know. though you've taken, well, yeah, you do, well, because because that decreases their profits. Okay. Okay. That decreases your now, insurance so is that company's the profits. Pharmacy or the insurance company? It's both of them. It's both of them. They have a deal, and they have a deal between them, mm -hmm. not that you don't know anything about, that each drug is paid for at a certain rate. And then they're, the pharmacy is going to try to have you take the one they make the most money on. Right. So okay. they make more money on generics than they do on brand. Okay. The pharmacy does. And, and they've structured it that way. Yeah. Because the insurance company has cut the deal with them so that they'll push generics because overall generics are cheaper. Why? Because nobody's paying for the patent. Right. So then so, I get a letter from my insurance company <laughs> that says, why don't you buy these in 90-day allotments right. instead of 30? Right. So I go to the pharmacy and say, I give them those 90 days worth. The insurance company says it's a good idea. Save money. And they go, no. The insurance company won't away. pay for that. You have to get it from the mail order 
Right, you have to send it away to Medco or Express Scripts. Well, you have to send it to the one that your insurance company right. is in bed with. Right. You can't just send it to one. But you got a book at the beginning of the year that says you have to look it up. The 3,000 page yeah. manual? Yeah, you have to look I up which, which pharmacies you can Written in extensive send it medical to. and legal But your doctor doesn't know. Yeah, oh, I understand. I mean, this is time consuming. It's, and for people who are chronically ill, this is a horrible thing. I mean, and, and oftentimes they can't get they can't, mail order helps them, yeah, and they usually get the system figured out. But if you're chronically ill, this whole thing is too much for you to do. If you're old, Medicare and your insurance companies banking on this, that you're going to be too tired and too stressed out, or you can't see the forms to even do anything about it. So you're going to just quit taking your medicine because you know dying's cheap. <laughs> well, or you get so confused you can't figure it out anyway. It's uh, terrible you don't take way the right medicine. You... Money and truly money and medicine don't really belong. I mean, you you have to keep your doctor in practice or they're not going to be there. Right. Because so they have to be paid some way. But we do we need insurance companies? No. We we should just look at the things we don't really need. We don't need insurance companies. We did without them in terms of office payments. Long ago, we used to just use insurance for hospitals yeah, we and Yeah, just take a couple of chickens and go to the doctor's office. Well, you may have. In Arkansas. <laughs> but I actually wrote a check. But, you know, when I went to my doctor's. But, I mean, that's the way it was 30 years ago. I don't want to go back to that necessarily, right. but that kept the doctor-patient relationship together. Yeah. And, and that kept all this junk that we now do and take for granted. It's so cumbersome. And that's why they leave you on hold. Insurance companies leave my, used to leave my staff on hold 20 minutes. There's no... No law that's going to ever prevent that because they think you're going to hang up and give up. Right. They just leave. There's a time frame for leaving you on hold. They have committees of people that sit around and think about how can they make you not get the care that you've already paid for with your insurance. Well, and what's really sad then, as as the consumer, <laughs> the person that I'm care. frustrated with is the person I'm interacting with. So I'm upset with the pharmacy tech of course, who's but it's really not a her nice fault. person and trying to do a good job I know, it's not and her fault. can't really help me. Or I call the insurance company. And get the automated phone system and the delay and the call us back tomorrow or you call the wrong well, number. To do a surgery, I had to sit on hold as well. And then I had to wait for somebody who's never done a hysterectomy for me to talk to them. And sometimes didn't even have a, a college degree. Couldn't necessarily spell Couldn't understand it. Yeah. what I was talking about, but was just there to tell me no, 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 no. Right. They look at their computer protocols. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, I want this. And they say, well, under hysterectomies, we don't do that. Right. Because it's in the computer. Right. Not because so, they know or understand, so, or are medical professionals. So when I so I'm wasting my time trying yeah. to get a hysterectomy through that the insurance company knows they're not going to pay for. Right. But they can't just tell me no because then I'll go do something else with my time, which mm -hmm. would then maybe get it through. It's a way of saving money. This is not going away with Obamacare because they're going to be in, they're going to be that in in the middle between the government and your employer and everybody else insurance will be in the middle they're not losing their dollar no. there and they're in control of all the dollars so that part's not going away it's just going to get more difficult but access to doctors is going to be worse and the worst thing is the smartest people won't become doctors anymore so when we because talk about, they won't be paid enough to do the job when we talk about the cost of medical care in the united states we're really talking not about the provision of medicine we're talking about the administrative and profit costs of the insurance It should be insurance system. care. Insurance, but they have yeah. such a huge lobby and so much money that we're not talking about insurance care. We should be talking that, that mm -hmm. way instead mm -hmm. of saying, oh, medical care has nothing to do with me and my patients except that I may not be able to take care of my patients. Right, because if, if, you, if you take people at the bottom who don't oh, have yeah. the, the money or the education uh, or the employment, to acquire jobs that provide insurance. Right. And so they don't have any insurance unless they're the poorest of the poor and they're covered by uh, Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So you just take somebody that's not that bad, but just a normal run of the mill person mm -hmm. who's trying to take care of themselves. They don't have insurance, so they go to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. uh, or they go to the public health clinic. Mm -hmm. Or they go somewhere like Planned Parenthood and they say, I have this issue after they've waited for a very long time mm -hmm. in very uncomfortable surroundings mm -hmm. to get in front of whoever is staffing the clinic today with whatever their skill sets mm -hmm. are then they say can you help me right is that 
that's help that's, me understand that. That's a terrible gap in in insurance. The issue is, I mean, in payment for medical care. The fact is, is that we don't have any provision for them except for buying their own insur insurance. And if you're sick. Right. No insurance company will sell you insurance. In fact, that's the pre-existing condition. I have issue. a family. Yeah, I have a family member who had gone to the doctor like she was supposed to, and she had a diagnosis written on one of her charts that may or may not have been true. The doctor was thinking it was going to be true, mm -hmm. and it it was nothing but a, kind of a hormonal imbalance. She was uninsurable at a young age. That's, so. That's, so that to means me, the as insurance much as you, company's not going to make enough money on her, so they're going to deny her. And all, of, and all of those other people could get insurance if they didn't have pre-existing conditions. But and, and, and to me, as much as you were critical of Obamacare, that is the best element of Obamacare, is that they don't allow pre-existing conditions right, it is. to limit your access to medical that care. Is, that's I, true. I think that's a marvelous thing. That's true, but insurance companies, I'm not sure how they're going to deal with that. They'll we figure don't know out the something else. That. And perhaps they will, uh, but at least that's an intended effort in the right direction. Right, that's right. So that's that's probably the best part about it. But what that also does is you have to take from somebody. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna take from everybody else. Well, we're back to needing as a nation to have the conversation about healthcare. Mm -hmm. And there are several components of that conversation. One is the pre-existing condition component. Mm -hmm. One is the end of life care. The, the incredible expense, probably two thirds of the medical dollars that are spent in your lifetime on you and your care are going to be spent in the last six months of your life. Right. And, and the, because they're extremely expensive processes, but also the question needs to be asked, how relative are they? How necessary are they? What's the quality of life that you will obtain? Is it worth spending $100,000 in care to buy you another week of pain? Well, that's one of the best things that Medicare has done because they have decided that if you go on hospice, mm -hmm. hospice means I probably have six more months or less. Or less. Then if you go on hospice, you're not going back to the emergency room. Yeah, you, you're, you're not just going getting back palliative to the care at that you're point. You're not going back to the hospital, but you have a nurse see you every day. Right. And a doctor see you once a week. And they're... And people understand that you're dying. And they, people know you're dying and you get the pain medicine that you need and everything's paid for. They want you to use the service so Medicare pays for that. Right even if you're in a nursing home. Yes. So, in general... But how do you get on hospice? You have to get a physician to say, put them on hospice, or assess well, them for hospice. But you have to have a physician to say you need all these... these right. No, uh, no, 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 care. I didn't mean that uh, in a critical way. I no. mean, it, people need to know, because oh. I know when we, well, we had an elderly called, relative that was yeah. going through it and had her own physician, mm -hmm. and we were trying to coordinate her care, and finally my wife said, is she ready for hospice? And the mm -hmm. doctor was like, oh. Yeah, her doctor was actually older than she was, so mm -hmm. his, his thought processes were becoming some <laughs> challenged as well. And he was like, yeah, I didn't think about that. And they sent the people out, and they said, oh, yeah, she's ready, and uh -huh. we got all those services then. Right. And it really, I mean, those people are saints, and God bless they them are. all. They are. They are. They're amazing because they we've dealt with them with my mother job. and my father. And yeah. and on my, I learned on my mother I should have done it sooner. Yeah. But so with my, my father, they're both in their 90s, yeah. you know, and so with my father, I, I thought, so, this is about, this is close. So I had the doctor evaluate him and the doctor said, yeah, he, he should be on hospice. They, he took, they took him and they took really good care of him. That is government at its best, but the reason they do it mm -hmm. is because they're saving a ton of money elsewhere. They're saving money at the end of life. And it's, not, it's also not government saying, okay, it's time for you to die. No. It's, it's government saying there's a process by which you and your doctor can decide mm -hmm. it is time. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not a death panel. Which, like, is, which is ideal. Yeah. That would be an ideal kind of a s scenario for other health care. Right. But other health care in general, when you're not talking about dying, doctors are wanting to send you for something to make you better. Yes. Okay? Yes. And government has deemed preventive care right. not paid for. So if they make a big shift and they pay for preventive care, which is still testing like mammograms mm -hmm. and pap smears and, um, and what I do, hormone mm -hmm. replacement, if they pay for that, 
then there's going to be this huge gap. These people at the beginning of this of the age group will be healthier mm -hmm. when they get to that age, but they still have to pay for all these people who didn't get preventive care right. while they're getting sicker. Well, so, and then you, so you they also talk about gap. personal responsibility and lifestyle choices and obesity and smoking and drinking and, and all drugs. the other kind of risk taking that people do. I, I guess the, what I would want to say as we get ready to close this conversation is there are sort of two frames of conversation. One is patient doctor. What's wrong mm -hmm. with me today? Can you help me mm -hmm. feel better? But the other is systemic and societal. How do we have an intelligent, non-anecdotal conversation about good decision making that respectfully considers the cost of care, where does the money come from and where does it go, who makes the profit? Right. Is it the insurance company, is it the doctor, mm -hmm. is it the hospital, is it the patient? And those conversations are so critical for our nation to be having. And hopefully our conversation today stimulates you to think about these things and talk to your friends and neighbors about it so that a momentum builds within our larger community to say let's face and address these problems intelligently. We need some problem solvers. Yeah. And I think prob my, my view is we need to elect people who are problem solvers. That's, I mean, somebody who actually can take a problem, come up with even with experts, just have the right experts around and actually come up with something that's not 3,000 pages in a book. Yeah. I mean, some overall re redo of the system, because the system is broken. Right. I'm just not certain that Obamacare is the way to fix it. Because well, really it's a free market. And, and I mean, we are living in a, in a free market, and yeah. that's not a free market. That is basically, that's socialism. And saying that, systemically, you still are a physician that provides the best care she can to people in pain, whether they have insurance or Medicare, Medicaid, whatever, mm -hmm. if you take on the responsibility to treat them, mm -hmm. you treat them. Mm -hmm. I do, but I don't take insurance. But you don't take insurance anymore. Anymore, but you... I did for 30 years. Yeah. Anyway, it's a challenge. It's a complex problem, and we hope that you'll think about it. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. Follow Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Brett Newcomb can be found at brettnewcomb.com.